Good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining the Parramatta River Catchment Group's River Fest webinar, Fishing Bats on the Parramatta River. I'm excited to learn more about these bats, but my name's Nell Graham and I'm the coordinator of the Parramatta River Catchment Group. We're an alliance of Parramatta River Catchment Councils, state government agencies and the community all working together to make the Parramatta River swimmable again by 2025. I just wanted to begin with a little housekeeping and about the protocols of this webinar. So if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in to the Q&A at the top of the menu bar on your Zoom control panel. And we'll, we'll be monitoring that as we go, um, both Jasmine and I, and um, we'll raise the questions with um, Leroy as we go. Uh, your microphone won't, won't work, they're all turned off. Um, and if we get heaps of questions, um, I'm happy to go over time as well. But uh, firstly, I, I would uh, like to acknowledge the traditional owners of our land, water, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Before we move to the main presentation, I just wanted to provide some background about the Parramatta River catchment. So the catchment covers an area of 266 square kilometres and it runs from Blacktown Creek in the west to Cockatoo Island in the east. The river is approximately 20 kilometres long and it's got many, many tributaries and creeks and channels crisscrossing the catchment. And um, our population now is nearing 1 million people and growing. So now more than ever, we need to protect our river and riverside parks. Um, our riverside parks are really important for recreation, but also for habitat and creating that connected corridor. During the development of the Parramatta River Master Plan, we identified 19 species that were important for ecological health and water quality in the Parramatta River. And the community voted on their favourite species and they became our mascots. These five species are the bow-tailed godwit, the powerful owl, the long-necked turtle, the striped marsh frog, and of course, the southern myotis or the fishing bat that you can see down there on the left-hand corner. These five species represent different habitats in the catchment that are important for ecological health and water quality. And the myotis bat is about the riparian zone. This is the vegetation that is clo closest to a waterway and includes the tidal area, which has aquatic plants and the vegetation on the river banks. Um, this vegetation, they, the bats require dense, fully structured vegetation and also rely on the vegetation corridors along the waterways to disperse throughout the catchment. So let me introduce the star of the show tonight. We're meeting Dr. Leroy Gonzalez. He's a research scientist from the Forest Science Unit at New South Wales Department of Primary Industries. Dr. Gonzalez has been researching the southern myotis and other bats since 2012. And after completing his PhD, investigating the importance of salt marsh mosquitoes to insectivorous bats. Leroy became the Australasian Bat Society membership secretary this year and is passionate about all things bats. His work involves research on threatened species, including bats in forested and other landscapes to improve how they are managed. He's done extensive research on the Southern Myotis bats distribution and habitat in the Port Jackson estuary and was pivotal in discovering their presence and, ex in an, and extent in the Sydney Harbour. So that's a great dossier of what he's done. And I'm going to, um, Start, stop sharing my screen and ask Leroy to share his screen so that he can start his presentation. Welcome, Leroy. Thanks, Nell. Thanks for the opportunity. I'll see if I can get this to work. You can. You did it before. You can there do it go. again. <laughs> it's never that simple. There it is. There it is. is that a, can everyone yep. see that? Yep. yep. It's right. up. Excellent. 
All right, well, I'll get started. Um, so firstly, thank you to Jasmine and Nell for the opportunity um, to present on Myotis macropus. Um, it's a really, I think it's a really fascinating species. Um, and hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll know a little bit more about the species and you know why it's so fascinating and why it's you know something we should be thinking about, particularly in the um, Parramatta, Parramatta River catchment area. So here is um, the critter we're talking about, the large-footed myotis or southern myotis, um, as it's also known. So it's Australia's only species of fishing or trawling bat. And if you look closely in the photo, you can probably see why um, it's, you know, that sort of bat that will hunt by fishing or trawling. So when I say trawling, I mean it will uh, fly um, close to the water surface and it will uh, rake its, its big feet on the water surface to pick up um, its prey. And I won't tell you what that is right now because that's later um, in the talk. Um, but yeah, so it's Australia's only species of fishing bat. It weighs about 10 grams. It varies depending on which part of Australia you're in and what time of year. Um, this species is also considered a threatened species in New South Wales, so it should be of management interest and concern. Um, some other interesting things that I probably don't have enough time to spend um, to tell you about is the breeding of this particular species. It's a bit different to most of our other microbats. Um, and maybe if there's time at the end, um, I might be able to just tell you a bit more, but briefly, they have kind of multiple breeding events in a year, which is you know quite different to a lot of um, other bat species. So um, as Nell was uh, mentioning earlier, um, there was some community voting to, to select mascots for the Parramatta River catchment area and for the group. And this is actually a photo I took at a, you know, at a conference. I think it was the Wetlands of the West Conference back in 2016. And there was someone, I think it was Sarah, was presenting on behalf of the catchment group and presenting some of the uh, results from the community voting. This was really fresh at the time. And I was actually quite interested. I was keen to get my Otis over the line. And as you can see, it's you know really good to see my Otis was the winner. And it's interesting, Myotis falls into the riparian group here, but I could almost put the Myotis into each of these other categories. So you actually do find Myotis in estuarine areas, in freshwater environments, and to some extent, terrestrial environments as well. But anyway, um, given Myotis is a mascot, um, I thought it would be good to tell you a little bit more about this species and then talk a little bit more about um, how Myotis is faring within the Sydney estuary, which also includes part of the uh, catchment area that Nell's mentioned. So going back a bit further, some historical records of myotis. So the first record of the species was back in 1970 in the Royal National Park um, on the Hacking River. And in that decade, there were just four records of myotis in the Greater Sydney area. The following decade, there was only one other record that was added um, you know, in 10 years. In the 90s, we had 36 more records. The early 2000s, we had 100 records added. And more recently, about 280 records. So some people looking at this might think, oh, wow, their numbers are growing um, in Sydney. And that's possible. It is possible that that's happening. But what we don't know as well is how sampling efforts change. So whether as much sampling effort was um, put in the early years to, to look for myotis, also um, technology has improved to help us survey for bats. Um, so maybe a lot of these new records that we're finding more recently might be down to the fact that it's easier to survey for this species. Um, but it's, it's difficult to know. But anyway, this is just to give you an idea why, you know, Myotis is um, part of the Sydney area. It's part of the Parramatta River catchment and we need to be thinking about this species. So I mentioned earlier, it's a trawling bat. And because it's a trawling bat, it has a close association with water and with waterways. So on this slide here, I've got about, you know, there's only a few examples. I could have a lot of different examples, but these are probably the main types of uh, waterways that myotis will use. So things like dams and ponds, um, particularly the larger ones. They'll also use coastal lagoons. They'll use our tributary waterways, so our, our rivers, um, some of our major um, drainage lines. And I've got a picture here, the bottom right, which is taken um, at Fort Denison. And we were looking to see if Myotis would actually venture out into the big um, expanse of Sydney Harbour, particularly right in the middle of Sydney Harbour. So how do we know 
or how do we find where myotis is? Um, we can try to catch them. That's one, one method of um, surveying for them. Another method is to set out these recording devices. So what myotis does, like a lot of other uh, insectivorous bats, is it is a species that echolocates. So what they do is they produce these high frequency sounds at a very rapid rate and they listen for echoes returning off objects. So if they're flying in a forest, for example, um, they'll listen for echoes coming off branches and they've got really, they're really intelligent animals, like a lot of um, microbats. They can process this inf information very rapidly and get a sense of their surroundings, um, including if they're looking for food, um, they can get an idea of where their food might be in the surrounding environment. And here's an example of what a myotis call looks like. So with a lot of bat species, um, they, have, they have a call. Um, most bat species have a pretty distinctive call. Myotis, unfortunately, has a call that's quite similar to a couple of other species that we get um, in and around Sydney. But if you do get a good recording, um, I think their call is quite distinctive. Um, so it is possible to, to survey for them with um, ultrasonic detectors, which is what we do. So we put out recorders that record these calls that the bat's making. Now I've got a video here. It didn't work when I practiced earlier, so I'll try to get out of my presentation and open it up here. Can everyone see that video? Hopefully, I'll I'll play play you a few seconds. This is just to show you how the bats no. are hunting. So they're flying. Oh, you can't see the video. We can't see the video. You have to stop sharing your screen and then share again the video. Share again. All right. I'll I'll try that. Right, here we go. So hopefully yeah. this has worked and you yep. can see the bats hunting. So they're the little yellow blobs um, flying, um, hunting just over the water surface. Occasionally, occasionally you'll see them dip their feet and that's an attempt to try to pick something up off the water. So, you know, a really interesting species. You'll often find um, a group of them hunting um, in the same area following similar flight paths. So anyway, I'll stop that video. I'll stop sharing and I'll go back to my presentation. Okay, so we know a little bit more about myotis, but where does it spend its time when it's not out flying? So usually they're flying out at, at night um, when they're hunting. Um, during the day, they will spend their time in a roost. They'll also do this at night to some extent. So once they've finished hunting, they might take a break and hang up for a, for a while before continuing to hunt. Um, but they'll use a lot of structures. So they'll use nat nat sorry, natural structures like tree hollows, caves, but they'll also use artificial structures, things like uh, wharves, concrete jetties, um, stormwater drains and culverts and bridges, just as a few examples. So on my slide on the left-hand side, you'll see a, a large concrete jetty or, or a long concrete jetty. And these jetties generally, um, or sometimes have these lift holes that were used um, when the jetties were, were installed. And some of these lift holes weren't filled, so they pro provide a nice cavity for these bats to snuggle into. And on the bottom left, you can see a, a cluster of myotis um, in one of these lift holes. Um, bats can use tree hollows, so particularly near waterways is where you find this bat species. So things like mature mangroves that have hollows, um, you can find myotis in, in those. Um, you can find them in other um, hollow trees along waterways. Um, stormwater drains and if you look in the middle, um, the bottom picture in the middle kind of column of images is a pretty small joint between culverts and it probably doesn't look like much there but there's probably about 150 bats wedged up in that little little gap um, so they can fit into really small crevices and on the right hand side is just another example so you'd often find them in bridges, particularly in forested um, environments over some of the major um, streams. They'll fit into the gaps between the, the bits of timber. Uh, what about the diet of this species? I mentioned earlier, it's a trawling species closely associated with water. So its diet, um, from what we know, is pretty dominated by aquatic invertebrates and also um, insects. So uh, things like water striders, water boatmen, um, chironomids, um, they also take mosquitoes. And on my slide here on the left-hand side is an image of 
what you know a single dropping from a, a bat on Sydney Harbour had in in their in their dropping. So you can see lots of insect bits and pieces, um, but we were also able to pick out uh, in amongst these scats, um, small fragments of bones. We didn't actually find any scales, which other people have found in um, scats from, or, or samples from myotis, um, but we did find bone. We were able to extract DNA and confirmed it was fish DNA and um, more work needs to be done to identify which species of fish. So they're likely taking really small fish, maybe uh, larval fish as well. Um, so going back probably five years ago, we recorded the species on Sydney Harbour for the first time. We were doing some work on another threatened species, the eastern bentwing bat, um, surveying a culvert, waiting for the bats to, to come out at dusk, and managed to see a few bats um, flying very close to the surface of the water body, so we, uh, of the water, sorry. So we thought, oh, that looks a lot like myotis. It's pretty um, typical of how they, they fly, like you saw in the video. So we had a bat detector, we recorded their call and um, looked at the call, um, gave us some more evidence that it's probably myotis, came back a few more times, um, saw the bats always close to dusk. So we thought, oh, they must be roosting close by. And we ended up finding a structure, a concrete jetty, um, essentially, with those lift holes that I mentioned earlier. And we had about 50 bats roosting along the length of the jetty. And these bats were also some of them were lactating, um, which means they use the site as a maternity roost. So it was the first record on Sydney Harbour. And we also found that um, where they were roosting was a site used to, to give birth to their young and, and to rear their young in a working harbour. So that was pretty interesting. So we thought to ourselves, where else is myotis in the Sydney estuary? Is it just that people haven't spent a lot of time looking for myotis in this estuary? So let's not, you know, let's give it a try, why not have a look to see where else they are. So a lot of this information that I'm gonna to talk to you about now has been presented or published in, in a paper in Australian Zoologist. So I put the title there and I'm happy to send it to people um, yeah, if you if you like a copy. But what we did was we split up the estuary into zones. So we had the Parramatta River, the Lane Cove River, Middle Harbour, and then we had the harbour itself, which we split up into west and east of the Harbour Bridge. And if you've got really good eyesight, you'll be able to see these small harbour islands um, in the middle of Sydney Harbour. We thought it would be interesting to see if the bats would venture out into the middle of Sydney Harbour, a busy working harbour. So here's a map which kind of shows you uh, all the sites that we sampled. So the black dots are where we've sampled and the coloured parts of the map just represent the different zones that I just mentioned. So it was about 56 sites in total that were sampled. This was trying to think when it was done. It was probably done in 2016. We sampled a range of habitats, but there were pretty much four broad categories. So we sampled bays in, harbor, in the harbour and in the tributaries, like the Parramatta River, um, the Lane Cove River. And bays were important, we thought, because um, some of these bays were quite sheltered and would often have quite still water relative, relative to other areas um, in the harbour. And that's important for a species like myotis that's looking for little movements on the water surface made by their prey. So remember, they use echolocation. So if you've got lots of movement on the water surface because it's quite choppy, it's gonna be harder to pinpoint, um, you know, a water strider or a water boatman or, you know, a small fish that's um, perhaps on the surface. So we thought these would be good to survey. We also surveyed along channels um, of the tributaries and as I mentioned, the uh, harbour islands. So here's a quick map which kind of demonstrates that work and what we found. So we recorded the species at more than 90% of sites that were sampled. And the colors on the, this map represent levels of activity. So how many calls we recorded at a particular location per night. So red being really low levels of activity to green and blue being high levels of activity. So one thing that strikes you straight away looking at this map is that there are particular hotspots of activity for myotis. And these hotspots actually corresponded to areas of feeding. So in the calls that the bats make, we can also look for other information, um, like particular calls that are associated with hunting and feeding, um, called feeding buzzers. And the areas of high activity were also related to areas of feeding. Now, being a talk about the Parramatta River catchment, um, it's a bit of a sad, sad story, um, at least in this work, where uh, most of the activity in the Parramatta River was quite low. Um, but don't forget, this is a snapshot survey done for, you know, two or three nights in one year. 
And since this work, more and more people are finding myotis um, in Sydney Harbour, um, and especially also in parts of um, the Parramatta River. So more work needs to be done to look to see whether you know this trend that we found um, is consistent um, over the long term. So with this data, we were able to look at the relationship between how active um, the fishing bats were and other things like the level of heavy metal contamination in sediments at each of our sites. And what we found was a strong negative association between how active the bats were and the level of contamination for particular metals, not all metals, so zinc was one of them. And we found that activity was significantly higher in sites with the lowest levels of zinc contamination in the sediments. But we also found that activity was related, negatively related to the amount of total suspended solids. I think of it kind of like turbidity um, of, of the water at each of our sites. So it wasn't clear whether activity was related to heavy metals or total suspended solids. We couldn't tease this apart. Um, this is just indicative. So we thought it'd be interesting to do some more follow-up work on this. And I had a student from the Australian Catholic University, Kayla Asplett. She looked at uh, heavy metal levels in myotis from urban waterways. And one part of her project was to look at uh, heavy metal levels in myotis in two different catchments. So a highly urbanized catchment and one with less urbanization, but still disturbance from other land use. And what she did was sample myotis in these catchments and collect hair samples to measure heavy metal levels. But she also sampled sediment and invertebrates that myotis may be feeding on to look at heavy metal levels um, in those two uh, features of the catchment. So here are the two catchments. Um, it's clear to see which one's the highly urbanized catchment, so Eastern Creek. Um, and then we also had Kolar Creek as the less urbanized catchment. And I know it's Thursday night, people probably don't wanna see plots, but I had to put in a few plots. These are some of um, Kayla's results. So for the sediment, um, all I want to point out is the bottom axis on our plot shows different heavy metal levels, uh, sorry, different heavy metals, and the, the y-axis um, shows the level of, uh, or the concentration of these heavy metals, and the main thing is that the Eastern Creek catchment tended to have higher levels of heavy metal concentrations than the uh, Kola Creek catchment. What about the invertebrates? Um, do we see a similar pattern? We actually found that really for most heavy metals, um, there were similar levels of metals in invertebrates from Kolar Creek and Eastern Creek. It was really zinc where there was a difference, where there was um, more close to double um, the concentration of zinc in bats, sorry, not in bats, in the invertebrates from the Eastern Creek catchment. And finally, what about the bats? Um, I'll stop early and say that the sample size we have for Eastern Creek was quite low. So we only had about four or five animals, whereas at Kolar Creek, we had about 50 odd animals. But um, the other thing I wanted to point out again was that generally for the bats in Eastern Creek, they tended to have higher levels of heavy metals in their hair compared to um, bats from Kolar Creek. And again, zinc is um, something that stands out. Now we don't know whether this is having a physiological effect on the bats, but we do know that for whatever reason, um, we're having high or we're recording high levels of heavy metals, um, particularly zinc in bats from Eastern Creek. So more work needs to be done here. But anyway, this a similar pattern was found for myotis in coastal lagoon. So it has been found elsewhere previously. Um, but again, more work needs to be done to look at physiological effects. So something else we've done, again, trying to focus on Parramatta River catchment. Again, um, we looked at myotis in urban waterways in and around Blacktown. So some of the creeks that Nell mentioned um, were ones that we sampled. So the first part of the project was to see if we could um, detect this species on Eastern Creek. So this was obviously done before Kayla's work. And we put out a detector, an ultrasonic um, recorder, and recorded the species after one night of sampling. So we thought, oh, we've got a good chance of trying to catch it here. So we set up some traps um, caught a few individuals, put some transmitters on them that we could use to track them uh, while they're foraging and hunting at night, but also to find where they're roosting. And we found the bats were roosting probably about 700 odd meters away from where they were caught uh, in a bridge. 
And you can see that glowing hotspot um, is a cluster of bats, and that's what they look like um, huddled together. Um, something else we did was we set detectors up as part of a citizen science project where um, community members would sample uh, sites that we selected. So we selected a number of wetlands, natural channels and urbanized channels. Urbanized channels were uh, channels that had been straightened. Or they tended to be concreted channels as well. And we wanted to see if myotis activity differed among these different types of waterways. And what we found was um, that urbanized channels tended to have lower levels of activity. So this plot just shows the different uh, waterways we sampled and on the y-axis going up, um, the number of calls per night. And you can see that the urbanized channels tended to have about 10 to 15 times less activity than natural channels and wetlands, but the wetland um, result also has quite large error bars. And what that means is that some wetlands had really high levels of activity, other wetlands had really low levels of activity. So because it's so variable, there probably, um, probably wasn't a difference between urbanized channels and the wetlands, but there was a clear um, difference between um, the urbanized channels and the natural channels. Using that, sorry, before I go further, the other thing I wanted to point out again was a high level of detection. So we detected myotis at 20 of the 26 sites um, that were sampled. So using that data again, we looked to see what environmental variables may be associated with the activity of the species. And we found that the extent of woodland surrounding our survey sites, as well as the, the size of the water body were um, positively related to how much activity you recorded. So the more woodland and the larger the water body, um, the more activity you would record. Um, conversely, we found there was a negative relationship with lighting intensity. So the more, the more or the greater the intensity of lighting surrounding our survey area, uh, the lower the levels of myotis activity. And this has been found um, for wetlands in Melbourne in, a, in another study that was done um, at a different time. So now, finally, just to finish up, I thought I'd tell you about a, a few other stories about myotis in and around the uh, catchment area. So something that's been done by, um, not by me, so by other consultants. So Narawan Williams um, has installed um, bat boxes for myotis, um, so specifically built for this species and installed them in culverts and has found that these um, boxes, you know, they may not be used straight away, but in time, um, you do see myotis um, come and use these these boxes. Uh, I can't remember exactly how long um, it took for them to be colonised. Um, some people on this in this presentation um, might actually um, have that information. I think it might have been around a year or thereabouts. But um, yeah, we can find that information out if you're interested. But what I wanted to to say about this is it's fantastic that you know we can build boxes um, for particular threatened species, but for a species like myotis, um, you know, if there are limited resources, is this something we should be prioritizing, um, given that they can use a lot of artificial structures and things like culverts and bridges in an urban area are likely to be quite abundant. Whether they have available habitat, little cracks and crevices the bats need is a different story, but that's just something to think about. What about um, foraging habitat? So people are maybe inadvertently creating foraging habitat um, for myotis. So Karingai Council have a pool to pond project or program where residents can get assistance to convert their unused swimming pools to wildlife ponds. And we thought, you know, if there's a bat that may take advantage of this, um, myotis might be it. So why not assess how much use or how much activity we have at these wildlife ponds? And we've been doing this for the last four years and the program has expanded to include other habitats. But just to tell you about it, a few of them um, and what we found for myotis, we've actually only detected myotis after four years on natural creeks and not in any of the, the pools to pond sites or swimming pools. We thought it'd be interesting to sample swimming pools to see if bats were trying to perhaps try to hunt things that might be flying over swimming pools. Um, but yeah, we only found the bats on natural creeks. And in this case, um, there was a low level of detection on natural creeks. So the, the species was only found on a single creek out of nine creeks. And that's been consistent over the last four years. So anyway, moving forward, how can we improve the picture for myotis in the Parramatta River catchment area? The first step is to identify 
the threats to the species. So some of the threats that I thought of um, just offhand was water pollution, given how the species forages, artificial lighting, modification to creeks, and disturbance or loss of roosting sites. Now I put this photo in there because I wanted to highlight, I, I saw this sign while I was doing some of the um, Sydney Harbour work, and I saw this bit, all methods of fishing are prohibited in this area. So it's a sign for humans, but I say tell that to the fishing bats. They don't know that, um, they're hunting uh, in various areas. Um, so what does this actually mean? If it's unsafe for humans to be consuming um, fish from particular areas of the catchment area, um, what does that mean for our wildlife that might, might be hunting uh, things that live in these waterways? It's just a question um, and hopefully we can have a discussion about this. Anyway, so some steps going, going forward, so steps to consider. We need to continue to clean up the waterways, I think. That's really important. So I know making the Parramatta River a swimming spot is a goal. Um, and this has already been achieved in some parts of the Parramatta River, like at Lake Parramatta. But again, does this deal with contaminants in the sediment? So it might be okay to swim in for, for humans, but what does it mean for contaminants that are still in the sediments that may become available to our wildlife via other sources? So it's just, again, another question to, to think about. And hopefully uh, people uh, who are listening in might have some, some thoughts on this. Again, retain natural drainage lines and riparian areas. These are really important. And there is evidence that wooded creek banks can provide potential roost sites for trawling bats like myotis and also minimize um, degradation of, of um, stream banks. And that will potentially reduce erosion. And as you saw earlier, um, total suspended solids turbidity um, could be an issue that might be uh, influencing myotis. So um, it's something we should be uh, aiming to, to do. And wildlife sensitive lighting plans for waterways, I think is pretty important. Um, a lot of waterways have lighting um, for human safety, um, but we need to balance human safety with wildlife, particularly myotis. Um, it looks like a species that is sensitive to particular lighting. So we can look at different lighting spectra, so different colors of lighting um, for waterways or areas that are important for this species. And there's been work done on this by a PhD student at Sydney Uni, jo Joanna Haddock. So hopefully work from her PhD will start to filter out and um, people will start to uh, take some of her recommendations on board um, and implement particular lighting plans um, for wildlife, including myotis. Um, also, some other things to consider is, you know, I just thought about this before the talk, diffuse lighting. So rather than have really concentrated lighting in particular areas, can you have lower levels of lighting that spread over a broader area? I'm not sure if this is effective, but again, um, it's just, just an idea, something to, to think about. What else? We can, or we can, we should incorporate myotis into urban infrastructure. Um, plans of management. We know that myotis use urban infrastructure. We're finding them in more and more places, um, wharves in concrete jetties. And the good thing is people are looking out for them now. So we want to make sure that we do maintain this infrastructure. So for drains and culverts, we want to reduce risk of flooding um, when bats use those sites for, for roosting. But we want to consider when we do that maintenance to, for, you know, to have the least disturbance in the bats, especially if they're breeding. And it's important to undertake any impact assessment works prior to, to doing any work to this infrastructure that the bats may be using. Finally, and I think the most important thing is to monitor the effectiveness of any, sorry, any management strategies. So it's all well and good to have these management strategies, but is it actually working? Is it doing what it's set out to do? Um, you know, if you change the, the lighting plan, is it ha actually having a negative effect on um, this species. So it's really important to monitor any management that you do. And further research, being a researcher, I always say it's good to do more research. So we need to identify, do some more fine scale assessments to identify hotspots for fishing bats. So the work that I've mentioned, they tended to be really snapshot surveys, you know, a, a few nights of sampling in a given season in a given year. We need to do more um, detailed work over maybe multiple seasons, over longer term, um, or longer time frames to look at you know monitoring trends over time you know what we have right now in in terms of what i presented were just snapshots in time so more research is needed and that will help us to prioritize which areas we want to 
um, put our management strategies or, you know, focus our management strategies on because we all have limited resources. So finally, concluding remarks, there's lots for us to still learn about this species and many ways for us to improve how we manage habitat um, for this species that was once um, probably overlooked in Sydney, uh, particularly in the Parramatta River catchment area. But it's great to see that the Parramatta River catchment group is now you know, highlighting this species as one of its mascots and hopefully um, we can do more for it. So that's all I had to say. And um, yeah, if there's any questions, I'm happy to, to try to answer them. So I'll stop sharing now. We have one question, Leroy. Um, how did you run the citizen science part of your project for wetlands urbanized in the natural creeks? The natural sure. channel, channels, sorry. Yeah, that's right. So that was something we did with Blacktown Council. So they had a they had a community engagement project where they wanted people to be engaged about stormwater management. And it's really hard to do that um, without having something tangible, like, you know, things that might be living in, in, in the features where stormwater moves through. So we thought that was a, a good way to try to encourage people to be involved. So how we did it was we kind of designed where to sample within the LGA and got a, a group. We were known as, the group was known as the, Flappy the fishing bat group and uh, members got nominated sites near where they lived, where they would go out and deploy uh, these recording devices. They would also sample macroinvertebrates. So we would get um, in information about macroinvertebrates and would send the information back to us. We would um, process the data. And then once we had data from all the sites, um, we could put that picture together about uh, the types of waterways that Myotis was using. So it was a matter of really us sending out um, our recording devices uh, to different members who had um, nominated it to be involved in this project. Cool. So ho hopefully that answers that question. Yeah, and I was just going to mention that um, we're working on a citizen science project for the Parramatta River catchment. Um, and I'm kind of developing an app that's specific to our species, but I'd need some um, my Otis calls and uh, some back calls to put in it. So I'm going to have to follow up with you, Leroy, to get that into our yeah. app. I had a question. Yeah, sure. um, I wanted to know how many insects or mosquitoes would a bat eat per night? <laughs> that's, that's a great question. Um, it's, that's a tough question to, to answer <laughs> as well. Um, like you often see or read that, you know, a single microbat will eat, I don't know, like 500, uh, 500 to 1,000 mosquitoes in a night. Um, but a lot of that is based, kind of based on work that was done in a study in probably the 60s or late 50s, early 60s in a laboratory where captive bats were released into an enclosure with just mosquitoes. And, um, you know, the number of mosquitoes that were consumed was then extrapolated to an hour to a night. Um, and it, I guess what we know is not all bats will eat mosquitoes. So um, there are particular, particular bats that will feed on mosquitoes because they can de detect them with their echolocation. So some bats just can't pick up the mosquitoes until it's too late. Um, so what I found, that was actually a big part of my PhD was looking at uh, which bats are eating mosquitoes. And what we found was that it was the smallest species. So um, the little forest bats, the eastern forest bats, so they they weigh like four and four and a half grams each. So they're pretty tiny. And they were the ones that were feeding on mosquitoes. We found their mosquito DNA in their droppings, but we didn't find that in any of the other bigger bats that we sampled. And our tracking of one of those species found that the bats would shift their home ranges um, in relation to where the mosquitoes were most abundant. So when the mosquitoes were most abundant in the salt marshes, um, the bats that we tracked would spend most of their time in the salt marsh compared to the other available habitats. But when the mosquitoes shifted to the neighboring uh, swamp forest, the bats would actually spend a lot less time in the salt marsh. So it's, it's more um, correlative, um, that, that relationship. But to actually look at numbers of mosquitoes, it's very difficult when it comes to bat diets. You saw that slide where I had lots of insect bits and pieces um, in a mic, you know, looking down in a microscope, it's hard to actually assign that to, you know, how many individuals does that represent?
Yeah. I've got another so question. Short answer is, I don't know. Yeah, sure. <laughs> All right. Um, it, it's also what else do the myotis eat and does their food change on, you know, saline or salty water to fresh water? Yeah, that's a great question. And we, we probably don't know. We probably don't know, or I don't know um, enough about it to tell, tell you the truth. I think a lot of what we know about the diet of a species comes from a study of bats from forested streams where the diet was dominated by aquatic invertebrates. I think fish might have represented like less than 1% of its diet. Um, but in estuarine areas or in, you know, salt water, it may be a different story, you know, especially a lot of these areas where we watch myotis hunting in Sydney Harbour, there doesn't appear to be many aquatic invertebrates um, on the surface of the water body. So when we were out kayaking, for example, um, we didn't really see many aquatic invertebrates that they might be hunting. So whether they eat more fish um, in salt water in the harbour in particular, where they might be more available. And again, we don't really know how their diet varies across seasons. Like for example, when they're breeding, maybe fish become more important or other invertebrates become more important. Um, so that's, you know, I think people have looked at that sort of thing overseas, but unfortunately for, for fishing bats in, in Australia, for bats in general, uh, it's really hard to do a lot of work. You know, there's more interest in a lot of other species. And I think bats often get overlooked, unfortunately. That's a shame. I, I actually think they're really cute and we should be promoting them more. <laughs> um, I've got yeah. two more questions here. So sure. um, has the myotis been recorded at many inland river systems? So for example, the Darling or the Murray? Yeah. Um, so while it's mostly coastal, it has been recorded on some of the inland rivers, so the Murray in particular, I know there are records, there are kind of ultrasonic recording records, but there's also capture records. Um, I think there are also records on some other inland rivers, like the, the Macquarie, there are some records. I think they're more ultrasonic, and I think we still, we're still waiting on you know, getting capture records to confirm it, but um, given they're on some of these other larger inland uh, rivers, there's a good chance that they're, they're on that one as well. Cool. Um, another question and then another one's come in. So um, I might wrap up with these last two questions. Are maternity sure. roost sites different to sites where they are not breeding? So are they choosing large hollows, you know, for maternity sites? Yeah. So like, Speaking about bats in gen general, um, a lot of bats have, you know, their maternity roosts are quite different to their, their I guess, their non-maternity roosts, their day roosts. Um, so for a lot of species, they tend to be, um, they, they can be bigger hollows or trees with bi um, bigger hollows because um, you'll often get a number of females congregating together to give birth in that, in that roost um, to raise their young. Uh, but for myotis, they're, they're a bit different. I think generally when you find myotis in a roost, unless it's the odd individual by itself, um, a lot of their roosts tend to be used all year round. So as a maternity roost, there are some roosts that are, that are different where they might you know, use it on odd occasions. But a lot of the roosts that I've come across, um, the bats have, are using them all year round. And there's a good chance based on just activity levels that um, their maternity sites. Hmm. Um, I had, uh, when, you, when you were doing the survey of the upper areas of the Parramatta River, even though you didn't really find many, did you identify any areas that you would have, have expected to find them, um, but you didn't, and that may be worth trying to restore or encourage them to come back? Yeah. Oh, well, I think pretty much all, all those bays mm. that were sampled along, you know, um, or like uh, I'm trying to remember what the bays are like around Iron Cove and because not Hen far from Chicken those bay. areas, Hen and Chicken Bay, um, all those, you know, Five Dock Bay, all of these little bays, they look great for my Otis. I, I can't really, I can't really work out why, unless it's maybe is there a lack of roosting habitat nearby, um, which makes it, you know, 
makes it more difficult for them to get to those parts. So your chances of recording them are less. But then we track bats from Sydney Harbour and they were travelling a great distance up the Lane Cove River. So, um, yeah, it's, it's hard to say, say why. But, yeah, I think pretty much all that area looks great. Even kind of, you know, the Parramatta River near, kind of near the weir just before the weir so kind of where duck river joins onto Parramatta river that all looks that all, all looks great i'm not i'm really not sure why activity is so low there okay all right well i had one more uh, one comment from someone from jules one of our, our river keeper volunteers um, as sure. an educator, she said, I developed spotlight tours at the Royal Botanic Garden, Sydney, and one of our absolute magical moments for our public was detecting and watching the myota skim the main ponds right next to the harbour. Um, was this a sample site in your study? Major habitat uh, trees on site, and also most people had never heard of microbats. Education microbats. on their mere existence is in the suburbs is needed. I, I tend to agree with Jules there. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like most people, when you when you mention bats, people immediately think of flying foxes. Not many people yeah. are aware of microbats, but um, so that site in particular wasn't a site. We did sample pretty close by um, in Woolamaloo, so. Um, we, we sample close by and I've done, I've kind of done walks in the gardens before and, and recorded and seen them hunting on those, um, those ponds. So it's, it's kind of great to see that they are using them. You know, it seems like they're using them pretty consistently, but it's interesting it's in itself as well, because they've got, you know, if they've got the whole harbour there for them to come out to the, um, to the ponds, whether, you know, is that, is that a source of fresh water for them to, to drink, uh, yeah, it would be interesting to, to do more stuff there, more work. Hmm. Excellent. Well, there's no more questions. So thank you, Leroy, for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us this evening on our gorgeous little microbats and the myotas in particular. Um, I'm hoping that we can continue or even start to restore some of the riparian vegetation along the Parramatta River to encourage um, the myotis to call it home so um, you know it's why it's one of our mascots and um, yeah we want to create the habitat that it that it requires so we appreciate that um, yeah everyone's saying thank you Leroy thank you they're getting lots of messages back to you um, and we appreciate that you've given up your time today and um, I might just uh go back to my presentation because uh you we mentioned that you're um a member of the australasian bat society and um i just thought i'd tell people what that is and you, anyone can be a member and um, it's a non-profit organization which promotes the conservation and study of bats so I thought that was important to share um, and then um, just that we're still in the middle of our river fest um, celebrating the Parramatta River and there's more activities over the next two weeks but if you want to get out and about on the weekend there's the uh, uh, cycling tour of the river with um, Charlene from Advantageous and then there's also a clean up so get out there and get your hands dirty and um, help clean up the Parramatta River. So uh, thank you everyone uh, for, for coming along um, and learning more about our big footed fishing bat. We appreciate that you've given up your time tonight and come and joined us for this talk. And um, thank you all for also contributing those great questions. Um, uh, so thank you for joining us. And that's the end of our webinar. And thank you, Leroy. That was excellent. Well, thanks, Neil. Thanks, everyone. Yep, great. Thank you.